So I'm not going to answer this question. I'm going to suggest to you Islamic ruling on evolution of non-human species, animals. I'm suggesting to you many evolutionary biologists, whether they're atheists or Christians, um, I can't, there's one Jewish one, I think, but definitely atheists and Christians, insist that there there are pretty strong proofs to show evolution of non-human species as a done and dusted issue before you say yay or nay at least read the arguments for it you might want to also read the arguments against it and if you don't have a science background, I suspect after reading the arguments for it and against it, you might just want to say, well, maybe, maybe not. There is no Islamic duty upon you to say yes or even no. But if, like myself, you're convinced with the evidences, then you can only believe in those evidences providing one we believe that Allah is the creator at every stage of every second every millisecond of those changes that happened over hundreds of thousands of years or or millions of years a bit like the earth itself the planet itself right in the grand scheme of things, it, when we're talking about Allah himself, who's beyond time, and beyond space, it's like, like a blink of an eye. And in the grand scheme of the whole universe, it's just a small part. But the Earth, through geology, the science of geology, kind of tells us it's about four billion years old. Four, or to use the English, four thousand million but we are now forced to use the Americanism billion, okay? I have a chip on my shoulder being a Brit, okay? So 4,000 million years ago, okay, this, this was a, a piece of rock, and then now it's the beautiful, fragile planet that it is and that we're so t carelessly treading upon, right? Um, Likewise, certain species evolved over millions of years to another species. We must believe that Allah did this at every step of the way. Not 10,000 years ago he, he did this, then another 5,000 he did that, and in between it just happened itself because nothing happens by itself. There is no cause and effect that is independent from Allah's creative will and creative act. A Muslim must believe that to believe otherwise is kufr, it's disbelief. If someone says that, look, E equals MC squared, okay, that somehow energy and mass, you know, the stuff that we're made of, okay, are related and the relationship is given by Einstein, right, in his special theory of relativity of E equals MC squared. Somehow energy can be converted into mass and mass into energy. Mass into energy we already did. The atomic bomb was probably the most horrific example of E equals MC squared that the modern world has seen, right? We can believe that because it's not in the Quran e equals MC squared and it's not denied by the Quran. It's just, it's maths and science. We can believe that provided that, en that mass doesn't convert to energy by itself or the other way around, by itself, it's Allah. When Allah says he's the creator, he's the creator of our stillness, our movements, there is not a thing, there's not a subatomic particle. And if there are such things as strings vibrating in 11 dimension space of quite, you know, string theory, then Allah is the creator of those strings. I mean, just Allah is the creator of everything. That's one belief we must have. Secondly, 
that nothing occurs except with the will of Allah right if Allah wills something it happens if Allah doesn't will something it does not happen we must have that basic belief and the third thing is simply this that if this process took place it needs to have sound proof and proof will differ from one subject to another proofs in mathematics are not the same as proofs in uh, in history and proofs in history are not the same as proofs in geology and proofs in geology might not always be the same as proofs in other branches of science and of course proof in the sciences is not the same as proof in in, in religion in, in islam say okay so the word proof um, and my only fi so 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 leave it up that that do you believe in the claim that uh, species turned into other species speciation look at the arguments and the evidences and there's no harm in looking at the counter arguments but don't feel that as a Muslim I must agree with the counter arguments because the Quran doesn't say you must. Otherwise, we're doing a monstrous bid'ah by as assuming and suggesting the Quran is saying something when in actual fact it is silent. We do know that things can evolve even in our lifetime in the sense that we have seen certain birds, certain small creatures adapt to their environment. Okay. Um, on a larger scale, fish to a horse or something to a bat. Look at the evidences. And if you don't want to look at the evidence, it's okay. As a Muslim, I don't have to. It's just that I might be asked by a non-Muslim as part of my being a, a an example of what a Muslim should be, a, a da'i, a caller to Islam through my through my behavior and in, inshallah and uh, through a few things that I say. Someone might ask me, a non-Muslim might ask me, so what does Islam say about evolution? And it's okay for me to say, I don't know. But if all Muslims keep saying, I don't know, it kind of makes Islam look a bit odd that there is something really important for today's world and no Muslim of any worth has anything to say about it. But as an individual Muslim, I might not have, you know, I might not know what to say. That's okay then. As long as I say the right things about Adam, as long as I don't say the wrong things about evolution, speciation, as long as I say, no, it's haram. Well, where is the proof that Allah said it's haram? It's really important we understand. Otherwise, collectively, we are guilty or we will be guilty of distorting Islam. And the distorters of Islam are cursed, and we don't want to be cursed by our Lord. Right? Don't speak about it then. Just leave it to those who you believe are more knowledgeable. Okay, Leave it to those who you trust to be more knowledgeable. But when you do say something based upon the trust, then say, um, I heard from a scholar or I heard from a knowledgeable brother in this field or I heard from um, a sister who's who I trust has written well about this, ABC, as opposed to making a statement of Islam or even a statement about yourself. And I think, and I trust that, what they said. Not in Islam it is right, because we don't know what Allah is saying. It's left for worldly proofs. My final thing was, so there was this thing that some people thought, what kufr is Abu Ali talking about? It's clear Adam alayhi salam, then I suggest they probably didn't hear the the one and a half hour discussion or they weren't listening well. Um, that is not my belief um, and it's never been my belief. Alhamdulillah, my belief is Adam alayhi salam was created exactly as per the Quran and the orthodox classical understanding of mainstream Islam. Uh, the other thing was, why can't we say that, look, evolution happened, but God is behind it because God is the creator of everything. Our problem with that is it would be problematic to say evolution happened and Adam came through the evolutionary post process 
for the reasons I've discussed um, early on in this in this conversation and in the previous conversation last week, that we couldn't say that because then it's like denying clear-cut texts. So we couldn't just say, look, evolution did happen, but Allah's behind it all. Of course, Allah is behind everything, but we couldn't say evolution happened with Adam. We could say evolution had happened with other creatures if we believe or trust the specialists and what they're saying. And the, the third common question, and every time I do this talk, it always comes up, <laughs> is as soon as I heard that chap say, uh, uh, say that um, theory means fact, I just turned off. So I don't know if they're listening, uh, and I can't remember if it's brother or sister, it doesn't matter. If you are listening, please try not to do that. You might miss out on an incredible amount of good. You might. And before I answer that, let me just express um, a concept, a general concept with an Islamic example, so that we can feel familiar with our religion and then take some of those principles and apply them elsewhere. Various specialized fields of learning, we may call them sciences. Okay, um, but I don't want to use the word sciences I, because people will think physics, chemistry, maths, like that. So I'm going to use various specialized fields of learning, have their own unique terminology. In fact, leave it alone specialized fields of learning. In the modern era, especially in the West, the various subcultures that spring up, especially when we're youths, we follow this trend and this fashionable trend, this music, these things. So stick into Britain, okay? Um, when I was kind of like, when I was, um, when I was about 11 years old, okay, or thereabouts, you know, on my estate, all of a sudden there were these people whose hair was pink or green and spiked, and they had these pins in their noses and their, and their leather trousers and jackets, they had all these pins and studs. You know, very soon we came to realise that that is punk culture, that was the beginning of punk culture, and most of us were scared or shocked, although they were like, you know, they're, they're, they're their bark was louder than their bite. They were quite harmless creatures, actually. Um, and you know that that was the, that was the mid mid to uh, slightly late seventies. Um, and after the punks came, like uh, new wave and new wave and new wave and disco, and new wave and disco rolled into soul and R and B and R and B and whatever, whatever. And then there was black music culture that was already going on with ska and reggae and moving into grime and garage and what, whatever and whatever. So and each of those people at that time had their the same words that we use in English, but it meant something different. So when I was growing up, if something was really good, it was bad. That's bad. I remember my mum saying, it's not bad. I was saying, yeah, that's bad. And I mean, it's good. And my mum doesn't know bad can mean good. When my oldest uh, uh, daughter, you know, when my oldest child, they're in their thirties now, okay. Uh, when they were at school, uh, sick meant good. I remember they're coming home and saying, oh, that's sick. And I'm thinking, who's been sick? Because the word sick means vomit, right? But sick at that time meant it's really good. And then, then towards the end of their schooling or college time, sick became bear or bear became sick. One of the two came. So bear was good or, and sick was good. And I'm thinking, but that's what happens. Okay. On a more serious note, in terms of different sciences, so let me give you an Islamic example. If I were to ask you, um, when in Islam, in Islam, if I were to say to you the Sheikh Khan, or to use uh, another construct, the Sheikh the two Sheikhs said this or that. The two, the two Sheikhs, Qala Sheikh Khan or Qala Sheikh or whatever it be in the thing, said such and such. Who do I mean by the two Sheikhs in Islam when we're talking about Islam? Any any guess? Okay, so let me help you both and let me help the audience. If I am talking about hadith and I say the two sheikhs said this and that, who am I likely referring to? 
generally when we hear scholars of hadith writing and they may say the sheikh the two sheikh said it's usually bukhari and muslim when in an islamic history book tarikh tabari okay the history of imam tabari in, in about 30 40 volumes and on those occasions in early islamic history early he, you know he says the two sheikhs said this or did that who is it referring to bukhari and muslim no, unlikely to be Bukhari, especially for early, early Islamic history, like in the time of the Sahab and the Tabi'un and Bukhari and Muslim are born from the th third stroke, fourth generation onwards. Who could uh, the two sheikhs be referring to in early Islamic history? Someone, you, you know, so you've got outstanding Bukhari and Muslim. Who could be the outstanding two characters here? Abu Bakr and Omar, <laughs> radiallahu anhu. If I'm talking about the humbly school, humbly fiqh, humbly uh, uh, law, and I read the phrase, and it often comes up, the two sheikhs said, is it Bukhari and Muslim? No. Is it Abu Bakr and Umar? No. In this case, it's uh, it's Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi and Majd ibn Taymiyyah. Majd was the grandfather of the famous ibn Taymiyyah. They are the two experts of the uh, humbly school in that middle period that become authoritative and if I were to say Shafi'i school it will be Imam Nawawi and Ar-Rafa'i so the words the two sheikhs can mean different things in different sciences so the word theory when we use it in normal everyday English speech it means a guess a hunch Okay, I'm speculating. Okay, I walked down the I walked at the end of my garden. There was there's a hole dug in my grass. Maybe it was the fox last night. Maybe it was, but maybe it was my cat, or maybe it was next door's dog who jumped over the fence and thought there was a bone there and dug. Maybe so. All of those are guesses. I've got a theory. I've got a theory that some creature has dug, but then it could have been like. You know, my wife was with a spade, but I know that it didn't just happen. Something. So I have a theory, and it, that it could have been the fox. That's how we use the word theory in ordinary speech. But the word word theory in the in science in the natural sciences is not used like that at all. And why isn't it used like that? I don't know. Okay, why couldn't they just? align everything with everything well that's just not the na nature of science is to do that okay the word theory the word for hunch or speculation in science is hypotheses if a scientist came and saw the hole in the ground and he was being all he or she was being all scientific about it they would say mm, well i hypothesize it could have been the fox uh so 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 my friend you're saying uh you have a theory no, 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 I hypothesize because they, they, the word theory so they mean something else. But hey, I live in East London, you know, or just I'm an ordinary layperson, uh, English person, that the word theory means hunch to me. Fine. But in science, it's not for you or me to invent terminologies. It's not for you and me to change uh, taxonomies, definitions. It's not for you and me to invent them. We have to take what is established. Just like you can't change two sheikhs to mean someone you you think two sheikhs to mean in that that or that science. No, absolutely not. Okay, that's just being ignorant, arrogant, or both. Okay, so the word theory in science generally refers to a set of proofs that describe some phenomena of the natural world that have been rigorously tested, that allow for experiments to be done to disprove it, and nothing so far has disproved it, and the conclusions fit with observable data or phenomena. Okay? That is why we still call the idea that 
everything in the universe in the material world is made up of stuff called atoms and those atoms are made up of even tinier stuff and those tiniest stuff are made up of you know possibly more tiny stuff that atom idea we still call the atomic theory will anyone in their right minds say well you know what it's just a theory no it's a fact it's a fact but we still call it the atomic theory we know that we are not going to jump off a tall building without without a parachute or something like that because we're going to be rapidly accelerating down to the earth and we're going to hit it and if we hit concrete you know that's we're going to splatter and we now know i was going to use the old gcsc thing that things things that possess mass that have just stuff attract each other okay so we are attracted to the earth and so that's gravity but actually maybe that's not the way we should describe it maybe we should describe it as actually like a trampoline uh, and you put a heavy ball on a trampoline and it curves and it curves the trampoline so heavy mass curves space and warps space that's theory relatively but it doesn't matter practically i know that something feels like it's pulling me down and we call that pull gravity and we know that gra gravity is a thing but isn't it love by it doesn't happen without god this is allah's way of making the universe work that he has uh, he makes this attractive force between objects but we call it the theory of gravity when it's so much a fact okay and there are a number of things that are facts but in in science they're called theory for a simple thing theory generally means fact in the science the good thing about a theory is that by definition according to the philosophy of science any good scientific theory must be uh, uh must be um, falsifiable okay that's why it doesn't work with religion you can't falsify god per se uh or or kind of from the material aspect concretely prove god you know the way that you could prove that actually you know look you know the fox dug the hole because i i kept awake all night and i used the a night vision camera and i filmed it okay so look at least for and i'm asking i'm pleading with you i'm pleading with all of you for the sake of allah when Islam is already being ridiculed at so many levels. There are things that it's being ridiculed for, and that's their tough. If they're ridiculing us for believing in God, then that's their tough. We hope that we can somehow convince them otherwise, but in the end, it's their tough. And we don't have to get all uppity about it and whatever, but we should be concerned for all of humanity's guidance and for restoring the remembrance of God in the hearts of those who have lost it or perhaps never had it. Right? That's the prophetic concern we should try to cultivate. But in the end, it's theirs loss. There's nothing we can do. But there are certain things where we are being ridiculed for, which it's our fault. And why do I want to ridicule the Islamic intellectual legacy, the Islamic knowledge-based legacy, which is so rich, which is so brilliant, which is so intellectually deep, so spiritually profound, when I don't have to. And this is one of the points that we're doing it. I mean, we're not the only ones. There are non-Muslims. There are Christians. There are atheists who say it's just a theory as well. So it's not just us. But leave other people. We want to represent the best of what humanity has and can be. Every one of us has an Adamic potential. We can flower into something that we that Allah wants us to be. So we're in the process of becoming. We're in the process. We should be in the process of evolving spiritually. But the world 
has given us beautiful things in terms of science and knowledge, secular knowledge and whatever, let's at least be truthful to that. So the word theory in science is generally talking about something which the scientists consider factual. Why? Because it's undergone rigorous testing. So let me end with this. When they say, when they say, the biology, um, evolutionary biologists say that all creatures are related by a common descent, they know that because of the genetic record. Someone might refer to a verse in the Quran that Allah created all living things from water. So is, isn't that pointing to common descent? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? I mean, it's a possibility and we'll leave it as a possibility. We don't want to be understanding the Quran only in the light of certain scientific uh, proclamations. But there's a possibility. I mean, it's not a stretch of the imagination from the Quranic point of view, but the genetics has taught us. And there is no reason why we can't believe it because it doesn't go against any clear Islamic belief, providing we believe that everything happened by Allah. When evolutionary biology or the majority of evolutionists insist, the majority say that, and yes, we have proof for human evolution. We don't believe that any two-legged creature before Adam, which it seems the fossil record was absolutely pretty clear, existed, human-like creatures existed with various brain capacities and various attitudes and styles of living from, you know, 200, 300 million years ago, 400 million years ago, and that all these various uh, bipeds, these creatures walking on two legs, whatever else they were, whatever else they were, they weren't necessarily Adam alayhi salam. Adam alayhi salam is that creature, and by extension, the rest of us are similar, in that we human beings are distinct with two things, or three things. Free will, but better than free will, a knowing heart, and then and a heart that can know God. And the rule, this rule not only gives us the life force, but it gives us the, the potential to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better than even the highest angels. We have the potential, not that we know them. And that's why, that's why the in Aqidah, in Islamic theology, when the issue is discussed, some of the early theologians didn't want to discuss it because the Prophet never discussed it, right? But when the early theologians did discuss it, they said that the uh, the Anbiya, the, the, the Prophets, Prophets, Messengers, and the Awliya, okay, uh, they have a maqam, a station higher than the angels. Why? Because Ahl Sunnah, Orthodox Islam agrees, Al Ambiya wa al Awliya humul maqsud min al qawm min al qawm. The prophets and the saints of God, the Awliya of God, the friends of God, are the purpose of creation. What's the purpose of creation? To know and worship Allah. Who exemplifies that the best? The prophets and the saints. And the prophets themselves have levels of exemplifying that. Okay, alayhi wa salatu So, um, you know, let's be, let's be passionate. Let's be intelligent. Let's have intelligent Islam. An Islam that says, well, whatever science or anything throws at me, I don't have to run around like a headless chicken. I don't have to get into identity politic mode. Yes, as Muslims, we should reject it. As Muslims, let me follow the evidences in light of Allah's revelation. Let me not... Follow popular popular Muslim practices because the majority of Muslims we are like a, a a reckless herd, and we have always been a reckless herd because the nature not of Muslims of large groupings of people is that they are herd and there is herd mentality, which is why let me end in Sahil Bukhari.
Umar radiallahu was with Ibn Abbas and another Sahabi, I think it was Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu, but I can't remember, but with Ibn, ibn Abbas. And they were at Hajj, and Umar is the Caliph, and Umar heard someone say that the oath of allegiance, the bay'ah given to Abu Bakr radiallahu was done in a rush, and it was kind of like, it was like there was an agenda and it was all rushed. And Umar radiallahu became furious. Right? So the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, it's a narration in Sayyid Bukhari, it's long. And Umar radiallahu says, when I have to stand up in the pilgrimage and do the khutbah at Arafah, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell the people what wretched liars these people are. I'm going to tell everyone what wretched liars, what wretched liars, what wretched liars or what a wretched lie this is. And the Sahabi with him, Abu, I think it's Abu Ubaid. So I'm going to say Abu Ubaid, but it could be someone else. But it's of that level, Ashara Mubashara level. Abu Ubaid says, O oh, leader of the believers, O oh, Amir al Mu'mini, don't do that. Because the Hajj season, season gathers the riffraff, the reckless herd, and they will hear your words and they will twist it out of context and they will misinterpret it and they will spread that misinterpretation and it will create a fitna. But wait, rather, wait until you get back to Medina, where there are the people of knowledge, religiousness and sunnah. There you may say whatever you wish to say and it will be understood by the right ears and the right hearts in the right way and it will disseminate from there properly. And Umar radiallahu says, Wallahi, that is what I'll do as soon as I get back to Medina. The reckless herd. The, the act Arabic, Arabic is Ghawha and Ra'a, right? Okay. The, the, the kind of, it's just the ragamuffins, right? If if that was the case of the of the of the of the Muslim masses then, 1400 years later, do we think we fare any better? So what does that mean? doesn't mean that we're all hopeless all it means is let us be careful of following herd mentality our love is for the ummah we have ikhwatul imaniya brotherhood or sisterhood of faith of islam allahumma izz al islam wal muslim may allah give honor and strength to, to islam and the muslims right but there is also on the other hand a reckless herd mentality that we see more than ever um, courtesy of social media. When it comes to knowledge, all I'm suggesting, all I'm passionately uh, reminding ourselves, myself and you, is don't be hasty, but there's urgency. Really, that's it. فشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت يا رب العباد وانتشت روحي وصار الدمع يجري يا إلهي خذ بقلبي للرشاد Oh, yeah.
عبادي وانتشت روحي وصارت دمعه